Now, hear the word of the Lord from Hebrews 4, 1 through 13. God's promise of entering his rest still stands, so we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. For this good news that God has prepared uh, this rest has been announced to us just as it was to them. But it did no good because they didn't share the faith of those who listened to God. For only we who believed can enter his rest. As for the others, God said, in my anger I took an oath that they will never enter my place of rest, even though this rest has been ready since the day he made the world. We know it is ready because of the place in the scriptures where it mentions on the seventh day. On the seventh day, God rested from his work, from all his work. But in the other passage, God said, they will never enter my place of rest. So God's rest is here, is there for the people who enter, but those who first heard this good news failed to enter because they disobeyed God. So God set another time for entering his rest, and that time is today. God announced this through David much later in the words already quoted, today when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Now, if Joshua had succeeded in giving them this rest, God would not have spoken about another day of rest still to come. So there is a special rest still waiting for the people of God. For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors, just as God did after creating the world. So let us do our best to enter that rest. But if we disobey God, as the people of Israel did, we will fail, or we will fall. For the word of the Lord is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between both soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one whom, to whom we are accountable. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. You may be seated. Good morning, Sojourn, and peace be with you. Uh, it's good to see you guys. Good to be with you this morning. Uh, my name's Joe, and I'm one of the pastors here at Sojourn. Uh, our mission as a church, why we exist, why we gather week in and week out, is to reach people with the good news of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us. Uh, build one another up as the church of Jesus Christ and send one another to follow him into his world. Reach, build, send. It's what we're doing week in and week out. Um, thanks for coming and being a part of it. Uh, this next couple of weeks, we, uh, every year we raise money, year-end giving to go to certain causes. Uh, this year, we talked about it uh, briefly last week, bonuses and buildings. Uh, bonuses, we haven't been able to give our staff any raises in the last three years, and so we're hoping to raise some money to uh, bless our staff, take care of that. That's not a me thing. A separate group sets my salary and all that kind of stuff, so I don't want you to... It's just kind of weird to stand up here and be like, give me money. And uh, that's not what I'm doing right now. Um, and so we, we want to take care of our staff. We have a pretty phenomenal staff and would like to take care of them. And so uh, if you'd like to help out with that, or you may have noticed over the summer, we had a $40,000 bill to repair our building. And um, these things just happen. It's over a 100-year-old building. We use it more like a community center. And we want to keep taking care of it. And so we want to replenish some of those funds. Uh, if you'd like to participate in that, um, you can fill out a check in the memo line of the check, put year-end giving, or if you give online, there's a drop-down menu, you can hit year-end giving, hit year, click year-end giving, and that'll go to uh, budgets and buildings. Gosh, bonuses and buildings. I don't know why I keep saying budgets. I've done that for two weeks now. Bonuses and buildings. Uh, next week, we start our journey through Advent. Uh, it's one of my favorite times of the year here. If, you've, if you're new to the church or haven't gone through an Advent season before, this is a, a season of waiting uh, where we try to put ourselves in a, a posture of uh, Real dependence and slowness and anticipating Christ's second coming. Uh, if you have children, we have Advent calendars for you out in the lobby, which is a fun game. There's chocolate in there, and uh, there's a letter from Stephen, our family pastor, to help you kind of shepherd your kids through the Advent season and bribe them with chocolate. Uh, we are not above bribery as a church. Uh, neither was Jesus. We can talk about that some other time. We, we, you know, sometimes you got to scare them into heaven. Sometimes you got to bribe them with chocolate into heaven. Both, both viable options. Uh, so if uh, if you have children, you can grab one calendar per child. And uh, so if you got three kids, you would buy get uh, three calendars. If you have eleven children, you get eleven calendars. No children, no calendars. That's not a me call, I'm just the messenger here. You can take it up with the student ministry, family ministry. Um, and so this year with Advent, um, you know, I, 
There's a, a similar theme of longing and expectation that we press into every year, uh, trying to arouse those feelings. And this year we, we, we want to maybe try, try differently than we have in the past about how do we wait, not just remembering that we are waiting, but how do we, how do we actually wait? What do we do in the waiting? Um, a couple of days ago, a couple of weeks ago, I guess, I was driving my kids to school. It's real early in the morning, and I try to ask them questions just to get them chatting. And it ends up being about like Pokemon or dinosaurs or Bigfoot. Or we're into weird creatures in my house right now. And so I said to my, my nine-year-old and my seven-year-old, I said, Hey, guys, if Jesus was in the car with us right now, what's one question you'd want to ask him? And I thought it would be like, did dragons breathe fire when they roamed the earth? Um, or was that just a legend? Because dragons are real, but the fire breathing part is the debate. And I thought it'd be something silly like that. And all, nearly in unison, they said, we would ask him, when is he coming back? Yeah. Uh, that's a nine and a seven-year-old thinking about that. And if a nine and a seven-year-old are already, that's a sweet question, but it also, isn't that kind of a scary question? Like, isn't there a part of you sometimes in the Christian faith where you're like, what's the deal? Because it's been like 2,000 years, you know? Uh, and so when are you coming back? And if, if that's a question a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old are asking, I'm certain a lot of us are asking it too and wondering, if we're going to keep waiting, how do we wait? Uh, and so we're going to stay in Hebrews through Advent and talk about kind of the fundamental rhythm of waiting, how we learn to wait as the family of God is through praying. And so what is prayer? Why do we pray? And what would it look like for us to have a praying Christmas this year? Uh, one where we learn how to pray through Advent together and see praying as kind of the fundamental way we learn how to wait for the return of Christ. And so consider this your, Advent, or your invitation to come journey through Advent with us or invite a friend. Uh, hope you'll be able to join us with that next week. Um, so where we're at in, in Hebrews now, we've been talking about what it means to be the church. And we've said, this is out of Hebrews 3, that the church is one holy apostolic family. We had to define a couple of words to assure you all we aren't Catholic. Apostolic meaning we're being sent in the creeds. Catholic, it's little c Catholic, meaning universal, not big C proper noun Catholic, meaning popes and Rome and stuff like that. We're little c Catholic, universal church. The church is one holy apostolic family. Last week, we talked about if we want to experience the goodness of that, what do we do? We said we're going to be a family that tells the truth to one another, endures hardship with one another, and learns to listen well to one another. And that was all out of Hebrews 3, and that brings us here to Hebrews 4, which serves as a really wonderful bridge to carry us into Advent. So Hebrews 4.1 says, God's promise of entering his rest still stands. So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. So as we're thinking about this throughout the next, I don't know, we'll see if we can do this about 20 minutes or so. Um, I want you to have in your mind the image of an incredible feast. Uh, imagine like a wedding from a movie where it looks fun, not the weddings that some of us have gone to, and it's kind of awkward, and is this fun, is this not fun? And you all know what I'm saying, that's not just me, right? So imagine like, I want you to have in your mind an incredible party, one where you, you don't feel self-conscious, one where you don't feel weird and you're truly excited. You've got the date circled on your calendar, that kind of a party. And here's what you need to know. For that party, the invitations, they're already sent. The, the food has been cooked. The meal prep is done. The table is set. All that's left for us to do is to decide whether or not we're going to come to that party. Uh, did you hear as Asia read the text for us, how many times the word rest came up? Did you notice that? In Hebrews 4, there's almost like this drumbeat of rest, 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 rest. And we talked about this some last week. It's not nap rest, which we're pro-nap. We're a pro-nap church. But some of you need to stop napping. You know, you know who you are. Uh, but we're pro-nap, generally speaking. This isn't, that's not what it is. The, the rest that the preacher in Hebrews talks about is um, rest from the works of the law. And that's that feeling of trying to make ourselves right before God or proving that we're worthy of God's love or earn our way at the table of God. And he's saying, trying so hard to prove yourself, trying so hard to fit in, trying so hard to belong, all of that is over. Jesus has brought you near 
Finally and completely, he did the grocery shopping, the cooking, the preparing, mailed the invitations. Will you come? The, the invitation to that rest where that compulsive way of life, wondering, am I good enough? Wondering, have I done enough? You can actually be free from that. You don't have to live that way. You don't have to try to stand up under that pressure. Um, the, the invitation to that rest is still standing. It's still available. And did, did you notice it's so sweet? This life is so good that some people are afraid that you'll miss out on it? It said fail to experience there, which kind of has the connotations of like you're going to screw it up or you might mess this up. Um, miss out on something is closer to the sense that's being communicated here. There's people that are scared that you're going you're gonna to miss out on the goodness of what this is. Not just miss hearing about the feast, but you'll miss out on the, the way it tastes, the way it sounds, the, the, the music, the laughter, the joy, the warmth. You'll, you'll actually miss the experience of it. And... The first service got real uncomfortable when I said what I'm about to say. I'm curious if you guys will too. Uh, there's times for me where Christianity feels a little too good to be truey. You know what I mean? Where it's kind of like, really? This is really what's available to us? Um, or party language makes me super uncomfortable. Uh, because when I was growing up, party meant like you're out getting trashed and doing drugs and making mistakes. And the party kids are not the church kids. And churches, we don't party and so I get all squirrely around this kind of stuff and and on a deeper level when I do believe it something worse happens to me and here's what I mean um, so my wife and I Allison is her name um, we love houses and architecture and uh, we love the Gilded Age stuff we love Newport Rhode Island and going on the cliff walk and uh, we've for years wanted to go see the Biltmore house which is from a Vanderbilt house and it's outside of Asheville um, and so, for because I love her so much, love of my life, wife of my youth, took her there for Mother's Day this last year. And the first 20 minutes of going through the Biltmore were awesome because it's the grounds and it's just breathtaking what people can come up with and just like the, the, the mind-blowing wealth of the Vanderbilt family. This kid didn't even do anything. He just got like extra table money and built the largest private home that's ever been. You know what I mean? It's, it's just all overwhelming. And when I go to these houses, usually uh, reality sets in by the time I get to the dining room or the ballroom. They don't have dining rooms like you and I have. And this is like the table would seat 150, and it has six fireplaces and 70-foot-tall ceilings with the tile imported from Florence or whatever. It's just so over the top. And they start describing what these parties would have been like in these extravagant houses. And that's when the tour stops being fun for me because a voice comes into my head and is like, you would never have been invited here. You know, like the red carpets, the Biltmore mansions, those are for the influential, the famous, the, the wealthy, the well-to-do, the beautiful people with beautiful lives. And at some point in the tour, I realized, like, I am none of these things. These people would never have had anything to do with me. I wouldn't have belonged there. And, and when I think about the kingdom of God, when I think about uh, what does it take to experience this kind of freedom, the rest of God that he's made available to us, there's a voice that whispers in my head, it's not for people like you. You don't belong there. So maybe it's hard to get excited. Maybe it's hard to feel like this could be good news, that there is a rest available to us, there is a feast available to us, because there's a, there's a voice in your head that says you don't belong there. People like you wouldn't go there. So maybe you're understandably hesitant. Well, maybe you didn't hear what the preacher said it takes to come to the party. Verse 3 says, only we who believe can enter his rest. Believe. How do you know if there's a place for you at the great wedding feast of the Lamb in the kingdom of God? Do you believe? All the, all the wedding feast, all the rest asks of you is to come to it. Um, and so you're, maybe you're saying, I don't know what to wear. Well, listen, you actually will be given new clothes when you get there. 
well, I'm not, I'm not clean. I don't understand how this works, but the journey there cleans you as you go. You don't need to worry about that. Um, and I, I could keep going on and on about this, but you know what, I, I really, I think what I'm about to say is true. I think most of the things I say up here are true. Some things I know more confidently than others. Uh, you and I don't like parties like this. Um, how do I know? Well, think about the last time someone said, hey, we would love to have you over for dinner. Would, would Tuesday work? And you say, yes, Tuesday would work. And then what's the first question you ask after you confirm the date? What could we bring? And then what's the worst thing for them to say? Only bring yourself. <laughs> and then what do you do? You go to Kroger and buy a $4 bottle of wine so you can show up and say, see, I belong here. Has anyone ever thrown a party? And they say, don't bring anything. We just want you. What should, can we bring something to drink? Can we bring a side dish? Nothing. We want you to come and enjoy. Have you ever noticed the terror that makes you feel? Why? Because you and I are, have an aversion to grace. Maybe it's an American thing. Maybe it's a human thing. But boy, we don't like being at a table that we haven't earned our way to that table, which makes it tough when none of us can do enough to earn our way to the table of God. And he says, what do you have to do to come? Well, just believe. What can we bring, Lord? I actually don't need anything. I've prepared everything. I did all the meal prep, all the groceries, all the cooking. All, I even hired the musicians. Can I work on the playlist? Playlist is covered. I actually know all of your favorite songs. It's all. <laughs> I know you don't like being helped. I know it. I know you don't like the idea of a party that is thrown simply because you are loved and you are wanted. I know that's hard for you, but listen. Trust is the way you get to the party. Do you trust you are loved? Do you trust that a way has been made for you? And if you don't trust, you don't get the party. That's what happened with Israel. They stopped trusting that God would take care of them. They stopped trusting that he would prepare a home for them. Uh, they got bored with their breakfast. They stopped trusting that God would take care of them. They stopped trusting the party was ready. You know what really messed me up with the whole thing about Christians not liking parties and thinking that was a holy thing? I'm starting to think that boring Christians is a real huge problem. Um, boring Christians, meaning the Christians that don't know how to have fun, can't enjoy themselves anywhere. And it was the book of Leviticus that did this to me. And some of you are gonna start reading the Bible again in January, it'll be a New Year's resolution. In Leviticus, in Numbers, that's when we stop reading the Bible because you're like, oh my gosh, what is going on in here? So when you get to Leviticus, I'm just begging you to stay until chapter 23. Um, the book of Leviticus makes a plan. It's God's design for, how, for you to live your best life now. You know, this is the way life is meant to be lived. This will maximize your enjoyment and delight in life. He tells you how to handle everything. Chapter 23 is when God gets into time management. So you want to know about calendars, you want to know what to do with your time, Leviticus 23 is where you need to go. And how does God arrange time for his people? It, their whole calendar prepared to have your mind blown. Their whole calendar was built around parties. And the, these weren't like prayer gatherings with one person on an acoustic guitar and we like eat crackers. They would shut down vineyards. They would be like, Frank, I'm sorry, but your entire herd is going to be wiped out at the Feast of Booths this year. Like these were hundreds of thousands of people clearing out miles of vineyards and farmlands to make the best food, the best drink, the best musicians. They were the kinds of parties that the neighbors would call the police over. You know, like, what is going on over there? And so God would say, in essence, he's saying to them, if you want to know what I'm like, if you want to remember, remember, these are people that he saved by his grace, by his strong right arm. He pulled them out of slavery. And he's like, I know you guys are going to forget what I'm all about and what I'm like. So you will not go more than six weeks without throwing a wild, crazy party. I'm going to teach you how to enjoy life. I'm going to teach you how to remember my goodness. And I'm going to prepare you for that day, the great wedding feast of the Lamb. I don't know if you know this. The Bible starts in a garden filled with food. 
The first miracle of Jesus is at a wedding feast, and the last meal we'll share all together upon his return is called the marriage supper of the Lamb, or the great wedding feast of the Lamb. If you think God is averse to parties, is averse to delight and enjoyment, you do not know the God of the Bible. If you want to obey me, you'll have a huge rip-roaring party at least once a quarter. That was the message of Leviticus 23. But instead, they fantasized about slavery. Instead, they tried to take matters into their own hands and live their own way. And so the preacher of Hebrews comes with a message for every one of us this morning. Verse 7, God set another time for entering his rest. And that time is today. Today. And that, that means today. And it also means this period of time from the resurrection of Jesus until the return of Jesus. And, you know, I've been thinking about it this way recently. Uh, Jesus, with his closest friends, walked with them for years. They did miracles together. They served him. They heard him teach. And a couple of years in, he finally looks at him and is like, hey, fellas, who do you think I am? You know, there was a couple of years of hanging out and coming along and seeing what's happening before he's like, what do you guys think is going on right now? Who do you, who do you guys think that, that I am? And my, my point in, in saying that is, is there is a time in the life of, you know, the journey of faith to be asking questions, to be around, to, to belong and be part of the group and, and wonder what is happening and, and at some point, there will come a day for every one of us where Jesus will look at you and you will know this day. You will know this day. He will look at you and say, what do you think is going on right now? Who do you say that I am? And today, because I've been talking to people who've been coming to our church for months, I'm convinced there are people here saying, I think today is that day for me. So, if you're the least bit interested in the party, the only question to ask is, who do you say that Jesus is? Who do you say he is? And, you know, back to that idea of missing out. Some of you, um, when you think of people being afraid that you might miss out on this, maybe you have it in your mind the people that shout at you before sporting events. You know those people with the megaphones? Really? Nobody knows these people? The first service didn't either. I'll, well, let me explain it to you real quick, I guess. There are people who will stand outside the Yum Center before concerts or whatever and have a megaphone and they'll tell you how awful you are. And they'll tell you, you know, how condemned you are. And maybe that's what you have in your mind. Um, it's not really the way you handle things if you're afraid that someone's going to miss out on something good. Um, what does it look like? I think about our church. And I don't know how much you know this. I don't... I worry that some of you may think that this is like the me show, like I just come up here and do this, and this is church, and you're not aware of how many dozens and dozens and dozens of adult humans it takes to pull off what we're doing Sunday after Sunday. There, there are people here through the week disinfecting kids' toys. Uh, there are kids, there are adults here through the week doing laundry over there. There are adults here through the week in this room praying for you. There are men and women who get to this building at 6 a.m., why? Because they're so pumped about being tired on Sunday morning. They're so pumped about making coffee for everybody. No, they, there are men and women here who have been so compelled by the vision of the great wedding feast of the Lamb that they don't want you to miss it. And so everything we do here as a church is trying to communicate to you and one another the goodness of that day, that we might experience it and we might learn to trust Jesus. Um, I don't think there's any church around here that can out meal train our church. Uh, you guys love cooking food for one another. Why? I'm just so pumped about doing an extra serving of dumplings or whatever. It's, it's because we want people to really experience and taste the goodness of the kingdom that is to come. We mow neighbors' lawns. We help scared moms find a place to stay. All we do as a church is aimed towards showing each other the glory of God and the goodness of his kingdom. And so you have to decide at some point, who will I say that Jesus is? And what will I make of this rest that he says is still available? L listen, verse 11. Uh, Let us do our best to enter that rest. Uh, what am I? <laughs> this is a, more of a personal sermon for me, I guess. Uh, 
I keep having conversations with myself. I did this in the first service too. Uh, one of my favorite things is uh, to when people will come up after sermons like this, whenever we preach about grace, and they'll be like, but what do you want me to do? And I will say, nothing. And that's the moment you find out who the real drug addicts in our church are. And I mean that. Do your best to enter that rest. Okay, now's the time you're going to tell me what to do. You're going to tell me what I can do so I can bring that bottle of wine and know that I've really deserved it and I really earn it. Remember what he said earlier. He said it's for those who believe. Later in Hebrews around chapter 9, he'll say, Jesus will come back to fulfill a salvation to those who've been waiting for him. What must you do to enter that rest? You have to believe. What would it look like for me to do my best to enter that rest? Well, what would you do if you had nothing left to prove to people? What would you, how would you live if you were no longer worried about whether or not you belonged at that table? You, could, you guys have been at that table, right, where you're not sure if you're qualified to be there? You ever had a job where you sit there and you're like, oh my gosh, what if everyone finds out what an idiot I am and then they'll know? What if that was gone? What would you do if you had nothing left to prove? If you have an answer for that, maybe that's what doing your best might look like, to actually live like you are free. Um, you know, Jesus says the first step of obedience to him is to repent. And now that the Hebrew idea of that, if you want to get a, the flavor of that, think come home. You'll, you'll stop doing what you're doing and you'll come home. He says you'll... You'll come home and be baptized. So if you're like, well, I don't know, maybe today is the day. Maybe I do. I do think I want to trust Jesus. What should I do? Be baptized. Well, but then I've got to stand in front of everybody, and they're going to hear things about me, and I'm going to get wet in front of, well, what would you do if you had nothing left to prove? If you weren't worried about what all of these people thought about you, what would you do? You would probably get baptized. Probably repent and be baptized. If, if that's you, that's your first step. Fill out a connect card, stop at the welcome table, tell somebody, we'll prepare you to be baptized, we'll celebrate with you. Uh, all of your fears when you come up out of that water and you hear all these people shouting and screaming and cheering will be washed away as you're welcomed in. Then we'll learn to wait for the main course together. Um, that, I really know that applies to some of you here. That's your step for some of you. Uh, most of us are on the other side of baptism, though. That's the nature of being a church. Most of us are here because we've already said Jesus is Lord. And I want you to know something. Coming to the feast of God washes you clean and it gives you new clothes. All that's required of you is trust. Um, there will be a price to pay as you come, but the price to pay will be the price of your own healing. Uh, and I want to try to explain some of what that means. Um, the healing power of God will sometimes in your life feel like pain. And if right now you're like, I know what you're talking about, I want you to know that's normal, and that doesn't mean you're failing. Um, now for those who are confused, let me try to explain. Verse 12, the word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow, it exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. I want you to know if you give yourself to trusting in Jesus, you will have to trust him in painful places. At some point you'll be forced to realize that the Bible is a book that reads you. It's not a book for you to control. Uh, the spirit is a physician who will come and heal your soul as he divides and exposes your innermost thoughts and desires. The Spirit of God is not a superpower for you to harness, to do what you want. And at some point, when, when the Spirit knows it's time, he will expose your innermost thoughts and desires, and he will begin to pull things from you because he knows they're not good for you. It's not a buzzkill God. It's not a God who delights in making you hurt. Um, the spirit is like a mom taking away scissors from a child who's running. You know? um, the spirit of God is like a dad holding his son through the pains of drug withdrawals. This healing that is available to us, this feast, it is free, but it's not painless. 
And your father sees things that you are doing that is really, really hurting you. And he loves you too much to let you endure. Far too many of us were told that following Jesus would just be easy all the time. Far too few of us were told the very thing that Jesus said, that at times following him will feel like dying. For if anyone wants to save his life, he must lose it. If you're here this morning and you're in great pain, especially great pain as a result of choices you've made out of trust for Jesus. You know what I mean? You trust Jesus and so you make a choice and then it feels like your life got a lot more painful after that. I want you to know that it may just be the pain of your own healing. It may be the pain of breaking free from an addiction. The pain of putting something that you once held dear to death. But pain does not mean failure. After baptism, the promise of Christianity is not a pain-free life. It's a life that will heal you and will end at a wedding feast. So the bottom line for all of us is simply to answer whether or not we trust Jesus has made a way for us to enter into his rest. On day one of your faith, will you turn to him and obey him? On day 10,000, will you keep turning to him and obeying him? I know words like obedience can freak some of us out, but just remember what obeying looks like. Remember what entering into that rest looks like, believing you have nothing to prove and learning to live free. Are you willing to receive the good news that you have nothing left to prove? Verse 13, last way I'll try to explain it to you. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. He is the one to whom we are accountable. Here's a couple of ways to think about it then. You have nothing to prove because God sees it all. Nothing you've ever done is hidden from him. Nothing you've ever done surprises him. You have nothing to prove because God sees it all and you have nothing to prove because Jesus paid it all. All of these things we feel like we're hiding and managing, he knew full well in advance. To live like more is required of you. To live like you gotta bring that bottle of wine to the party. To live like more is required of you is to say with your life, not your words, but your life, that the perfection of Jesus was not enough, that the blood of Jesus was not precious enough, or the resurrection of Jesus was not powerful enough. But it says we're accountable at the end. It does. What are you accountable to? You're accountable to whether or not you want to go to the party. And so I have, this is stunning to me. I have been collecting paychecks from churches for 22 years at this point. And I know a thing or two about Christians. Um, you guys don't like having fun. Um, you guys don't like the idea that you really are loved. And by you guys, I mean us, these weird evangelical Christians. You don't like the idea of being saved by grace. And the longer I'm in the scriptures, the longer I've been this, here's what I think the last day is going to be like. I think you're going to wake up confused. Because you thought you, de you were dead. You know, you're like, I was in a hospital. Now where am I? You're going to be like Frodo waking up in white linen sheets or something. You're going to wake up. And you're going to smell smells. And you're going to hear music. And a man's going to walk in and says, hey, good morning. I've made some food for you. Would you like to come to the party? And then you will decide. Would you like to come to the party or not? And do you know who doesn't go to the party? are the people who say, I don't want to go to the party. That's who gets left out. That's who stays behind. Each will be held accountable to whether or not we receive the invitation into the great wedding feast of the Lamb. So today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Listen, trust him. Come home to him. Come to the feast. Because today, Jesus is inviting you into an enduring way of life, not a pain-free one, but an enduring way of life that begins in the waters of baptism and it ends at the great wedding feast of the Lamb. Let's pray.